Natalie Dupree Cooks is made possible in part by Publix Supermarkets. Publix is pleased to support this and other quality public broadcasting programs. Hello, I'm Natalie Dupree. On today's menu, I'm serving thick and hearty tomato herb soup. Turkey vegetable loaf sounds not as good as it is. It's wonderful. Mushroom risotto and lemon poppy seed scones. Let me show you now how to make this wonderful, thick and hearty tomato herb soup. It's a mouthful. I'm going to melt some butter over medium heat over there while I chop some onions. And if you really want to save time, you'll chop your onions ahead of time in, in batches. Um, enough for several days or a week. I'm a big onion user, so uh, a week's worth is hard to do. But do try. Cut into the root just following the lines, and then across, and then down. And toss that into your pan with your melted butter. Come on now. Get going there. It's starting to talk to me. I like it when my butter sings. You should add it when your butter is singing. And then add some chopped celery. That's another thing that you can chop in advance, but of course celery is always so helpful. You can, it stretches out any meal, helps add bulk to any soup if you need to. It's a wonderful thing to keep on hand, and of course it's good for you. So cook it until your celery is tender. It takes, uh, you know, about seven to ten minutes. Now it's important to get them good and soft before you add your tomatoes and your basil and your oregano. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, because if you add your tomatoes too soon, that onion, it doesn't seem to me, ever really gets soft enough. There's something about the acid that seems to work against you. So be sure to get it done. Do as I say, not as I do. And then go ahead and cook your tomatoes. Now what I have here is some lovely fresh chopped basil, some oregano, some thyme, and some parsley. Now, if you don't have all those lovely fresh herbs growing in your yard, as I hope that you do, um, what you can do is always chop, try to get some fresh parsley anyway. They usually have that at the grocery store. And if you buy it, you can e actually let it, put it in a glass and let it drink for at least a week in your refrigerator usually. Um, and then if you chop some fresh parsley with some of those dried herbs, it'll kind of do a moisture exchange. It'll perk them up a lot more and get, seems to me it gets them back to their regular um, taste, a fresher taste anyway, if not completely back. Here's some bay leaves. <clears throat> you have to either tie your bay leaves or you have to break them. As you may have heard me say before, it is very rude to choke your guests. And if someone gets a bay leaf in their throat, they can choke at your very dining room table, which you really don't want. So then go ahead now here and add some stock. This is canned bouillon. You could make, up, make it up with bouillon cubes. It's a little dark. Once I made a fabulous, fabulous soup because I didn't have any stock and I took an old ham bone and just cooked it in some water and used that stock in my tomato soup. Boy, it was fabulous. So any kind of flavored liquid that you have, you can use a vegetable, uh, can of vegetable stock from, from, the, uh, from the shelves that you've got. And if all else fails, you can just take and, and take whatever you've got around the house and boil it up in some liquid and use that as your broth or stock. Because what you're trying to do is just get some nice flavor in here. Now you bring it to the boil and you simmer it about 30 minutes. Then you remove it from the heat and you remove those bay leaves that I talked about and you puree your soup in batches. Let me get a slotted spoon and show you how to do that here. Um, take your slotted spoon and just take out all these good things right here. And a, a blender works every bit as well as a food processor, I find, for these purees. Or you may want to use one of those liquidizer emulsifiers if you prefer. And just go ahead. Here, let me just see if I get the rest of it out here. 
You want to leave it slightly chunky, so a few bits in there. It's not going to matter. It's not perfect. It's not going to be a perfect soup. Then I'm going to go ahead and take this. Now, to, to do this, you want to take and keep your finger in here so that you don't get the blade in your soup. That is also considered rude to serve your soup with the food processor blender in it, blade in it. I have done that, I know. So you want not to do that. Now go ahead and put it into your pot right here. Add just a little sugar. You know, whenever you have canned tomatoes, well even fresh tomatoes too, just a little sugar brings out that underlying flavor underneath it. It develops it and makes it uh, fuller somehow. And the little sweetness takes off that edge that they get. So go ahead, uh, put some sugar in there, salt and pepper, pepper, and serve it nice and piping hot. Now, if in your refrigerator or your freezer you have some wonderful Parmigiano Reggiano or even a, a nice Parmesan, go ahead and put it on the top. This is shaved, beautifully shaved. Put it on the top, it just gives it a little add texture. You want a little chunk in the soup anyway. This is not a fine soup. And of course, you could always add a few um, fresh pieces of fresh thyme if you would like. Um, a lot of people do garnish with this thyme. I'll just tell you this very quickly. A lot of people do garnish with the fresh thyme. I mean, you might see something like that on a soup. But frankly, I think it's also rude to serve people little sticks. So I think you ought to take it off of the little sticks, and preferably not right over the soup, but separately here, and then put it on top. And now let's leave my TV kitchen here in New York, back to my home kitchen in Atlanta. Right now we're here in my own kitchen so that I can show you how to prepare things for the freezer. I use my freezer a great deal. There are a few tricks. First of all, freezer bags come in several different kinds. Look for the opaque ones, no matter who the manufacturer is. These clear ones, and I know that's hard for you to see, but the clear ones don't freeze very well. You, they, you tend to get ice crystals when you use them. Freezer paper is wonderful. Well, for me, it works best when you have a butcher wrap. Now, I want to be sure that you would never, I always keep a chicken on hand, and I want to be sure that you would never take a chicken and freeze it right in the plastic bag that it came in. Because if you do that, what's going to happen to you is that this freezes solid in it and it becomes very difficult to defrost. So one of the things that I do before I get started with my chicken is that I remove the chicken fat, remove the innards and other things and freeze them in a separate plastic bag, which I mark so that I can see what they are. Separate container would be fine. And then pop my chicken into another freezer bag. That way I know that it will take less time for it to defrost than if it was all impacted there together. Now here is some homemade turkey stock and it's best to try to get all the air bubbles out, but it's not perfect, it's pretty difficult. Keep it in, in your opaque container and mark it with the date that you put it into the freezer. Freeze it flat so that it won't be cattywampered on your shelves. Or alternately, if that's too much a quantity for your family and you want to make just a quick sauce, use a nice freezer container that holds just a cup or two exactly what you need for your family. Be sure always, remember the trick, Get rid of as much air as possible. That's your enemy. Now, if you did what I talked about earlier, chopped all your onions at one time, then you'd have your onions already chopped, like I do, to go on and get cooking. So while those are cooking, I want to show you the rest of the things that we do. Start with some dried mushrooms. Now, uh, not too long ago, I showed you a segment that where I had gone to Finland and picked some fresh mushrooms, and then we had dried some and used some in a mu lovely mushroom duke cell. I just want to caution you and remind you that uh, you should dried mus that mushrooms can be poisonous, so you have to know them, or you have to buy them from a reliable source. These are dried mushrooms. 
Here are some wood ears. <coughs> uh, let's see, here are some chanterelles and some shiitakes um, and just some plain seps and other kinds of mushrooms. And you can really choose your favorite one. We have all sorts of wonderful wild ones right now. What I've got over here are some soaking in some boiling water. So I put them in a bowl or a glass with boiling water and just covered them with boiling water. And you let them sit until they're reconstituted and then they feel spongy, you know, and mobile and they're kind of like a reconstituted anything. They've got a little more oomph to them. Now, take them and strain them. And I like to use a little piece of cheesecloth or, or at home I have a beautiful, beautiful conical sieve that's a very, got a very good strainer. Oop, I didn't do the right thing. That wasn't very smart. I should have put the mushrooms in first. Here, let me show you what I want to do. And then you want to, because you want to catch all the sediment in the bottom here of the mushrooms. So you take the mushrooms out first and then strain the broth. That was the point of this exercise. But anyway, get them all in here. And then you're going to combine your broth and your mushrooms. and your stock here. But first I want to roughly chop my mushrooms, that's is what I should have done in the first place, and add it to my cooked cooking onions. Add them to the, my cooked onions. I could even restrain this and I probably will just to get all that sediment out. I think that's what I'll do. That's it. Now, just chop these up. I'm going to turn that heat down just a little bit. I've got it, sometimes I start this electric stove on high then I have to move it down a little bit, cut it down a little bit, because it goes faster than I'd like. Chop these roughly, and you know you can chop these in the food processor, they'd work just fine. Now here's a little hard bit, so it's nice to do it in that case by hand, because if something is hard, you can get rid of it. It'll still add flavor because of its broth. <coughs> And now you walk your knife over the mushrooms so that the small pieces fall to the bottom. It smells wonderful here. The aroma is fabulous. <clears throat> now, as I said, I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about picking wild, wild mushrooms. If you do pick your own, you should ha always have someone go with you that knows what they're doing. Picking wild mushrooms is not something that you should do if you don't know anything about it. And a lot of these so-called wild mushrooms that we're getting here today are actually being grown now. Now here's where I'll strain my nice broth in. My onions are transparent. I want to go ahead now and add my rice. And I want to stir it until that's thoroughly coated. Now this is a very special kind of a rice that's used for arborio. It's a nice short grain. You'll see it <clears throat> called arborio rice for risotto or even sometimes just for sale called rice for risotto. And you just stir the rice until it's thoroughly coated and then you pour, this is the case of the uh, <laughs> returning stock, this is going to be a super strained broth. I just want to show you um, that you only add a half a cup or so of the stock at a time to the rice. Now some people like doing this in the microwave. My friend Barbara Kafka does. Um, I just love the process so much that I don't mind doing this. But you have to be willing to stand in the kitchen and stir to do this. Uh, otherwise do what she does, buy her microwave book and, instead of my book and cook it in the microwave. <laughs> so go ahead and add it up half a cup at a time. And then you have to keep stirring it overheat until it's all absorbed. You don't want to drown this poor rice. Um, that's the phrase that we use. So just keep doing that until all of this lovely liquid has absorbed. And I want it to come back up to the boil so that you can see it. Um, because you keep continuing to cook it until the risotto has reached a creamy, creamy texture and it's what we call el dante. So come on now, boil. Sort of case here of the watch pot never boiling. Maybe the burner was off there, was off whack. Um, I have done this when I was desperate. I have used, tried to make a risotto with regular long grain rice. And you can make something that's quite palatable and quite nice. 
using this process, cooking the rice over heat, but it won't be, it won't have the little texture and density. The saborio rice, it kind of is all separated and it, yet it stays together. It's just quite different. But you can substitute your rices if you need to, if you're in a tight. Um, so don't rule it out. Here it comes back up to the boil now. And you can see that it's starting to absorb very, very nicely. Now, let's talk a little bit about our menu before we get there. Um, <clears throat> what you don't want to do is to use the same ingredient in a pronounced way in a menu. For instance, if you do my turkey vegetable loaf, you might want to coat it with something else other than the tomato sauce that's used so that you wouldn't be reinforcing tomato in the first course with the Parmesan and then in the second course the tomato loaf with the Parmesan even though we're going to show it to you that way or you might even want to do either or and the same thing is true with the Parmigiano Reggiano here if you if it's subtle enough for you then you don't have to worry now don't stir this in with the with a uh, spoon like I'm doing stir it in with a fork now season it to taste with salt and pepper and then you serve it immediately. It also reheats wonderfully in the microwave and you can refri refrigerate it. And when I come back, I'm going to show you these wonderful lemon poppy seed scones. Finally, I want to show you these lovely, lovely, lovely lemon poppy seed scones. You're going to adore them. Now, I've got some flour here that I have just uh, mixed, sifted together with some baking soda and some salt. I'm going to add just a little sugar here and some freshly ground coriander. What is an interesting taste. Um, I think you're going to like it, but you could add cumin if you wanted to, if you're a great cumin fan, or a little cinnamon, or nothing, but they just... You know, anything that you have on the pantry shelf that will give a little pizzazz, why not try it? Now let's go ahead now and cut in our chilled butter. This has gotten just a little soft. You might want yours just a little more chilled. Um, you just have a little more control. And it's just like making a biscuit. This is very similar to making a biscuit dough. So those of you that stop me and say, I can't make biscuits, this is the thing. Now just remember, <coughs> First time you make something like this, and it is easier than, it, than uh, people seem to make it out to be, but most of us were not born knowing how to make biscuits and pie crusts. Not even our mothers were. Uh, but somehow or other, that, that aura has gone on ahead of us that um, we're not the women or men that we want to be unless we can make a good biscuit or a good scone. And it takes practice, just like tennis or golf or anything else that you like doing. So give yourself permission sometime just to get up one morning, close the kitchen door, and don't tell anybody what you're doing, and practice making, uh, practice making some of these. It, it's fun, and it's wonderful. And then you'll have them for when you need an emergency. Now, I have a little egg here and a little buttermilk. I do keep uh, dried buttermilk on my shelf, but um, you can use regular milk if you want to, or even evaporated milk. You could even use whipping cream. If you wanted to use sweetened condensed, you just have to leave the sugar out. It wouldn't affect the recipe too much. So just whatever you can find on hand. And then you just, um, ooh, I've got to add my poppy seeds to it. 
and my lemon peel. And I don't want to, um, this is grated lemon peel. I'll show you how to do that in a second. I don't want to overwork my dough. And it could be just a smidgen um, drier than this probably, but I'll show you this. It's, no, it's wet. It's nice and wet. Now go ahead and take here. I want to sprinkle my surface area with my flour. I could do all of this in the bowl, bowl, but I think it'll be easier for you to see over here. You just pat it out. There we go. If I had a little more buttermilk, uh, flour is never the same two days twice, so you can't count on anything. And if I wanted to, I could fl flip it over in the bowl instead of just moving it over to here. Now, flour your hands. And I keep a flour shaker on hand, but there's powdered sugar in that one I'll show you at the end. And the other day I used the powdered sugar instead, so I think we got to the point where we weren't going to use two. Now, take and pull off, pinch off a piece of the dough about the size of an egg. If it's wet, this is not as quite as wet as I was thinking it would be, and that's a difference in flour again, it's a dry day. Then you dip it into some flour and roll it. Now here's the technique. Cup your fingers like this and like this. Put it in the flat, in the heel of your hand, and work your dough around so that it hits the top of your hand. And actually it's getting wetter as I go. Then take it, and you're kneading it, and that's developing it, and put it, uh, it's in a ball, then you flatten it slightly, and put it on your prepared pan. Now, you don't want any sex on the pan. Um, when you have um, biscuits, I like to put my biscuits close together so they don't get brown on the outside, but in this case, we don't want them touching. We want them just a little bit separate from each other. And that needs to be needed just a little bit more. Let me just get it a little bit better here. And it needed just that flour on my hand. You bake them in a very hot oven like you do biscuits. About 500 degrees there. Now that's nice and smooth. Okay, pull off another batch. And I'll keep doing this while we talk. And bake it 500 degrees for about 10 minutes or until golden brown. Then they cool on a rack slightly. I'll show you that, and we sprinkle it with confectioner's sugar, powdered sugar, we call it, also sometimes. Now, as it sits here, it's getting just a little wetter, so there we go. Here, we're going to dip it right in that flour. That's just so the wet side uh, gets coated with flour, the part that hits your hand. Now, one more time, very slowly. Roll it, cup your fingers, so that these two fingers are shaping the side. This heel of your hand is shaping the, the top, and this heel of your hand that's cupped is shaping the bottom. And that's all smoothing it out. Here you go. One more time. I don't, I don't like those little ridges on the top. How about that? If you have those little ridges on the top, you can turn it upside down and put it on. Now, the goal is to get everyone the same. If you don't have this, you can also just punch out around and put it over there if that makes you more comfortable. And you could do this on a floured tea towel or a floured surface of any sort. Now, just let me show you my whole wonderful menu here. Once I shake this with a little powdered sugar there, I'm sure it's powdered sugar because I tasted it. What I have is a thick and hearty tomato herb soup. Then I have a lovely turkey vegetable loaf, but I wouldn't put the tomato topping on it if I was going to serve it with the tomato soup so that it wouldn't look the same. I have mushroom risotto and the parmesan is hidden, so I think it's quite all right that I have parmesan on the top of the soup after all, and some lemon poppy seed scones, which would be wonderful. Split and filled with whipped cream. You could serve them with lemon curd. It would be wonderful to serve them with jam. Um, raspberry jam would be terrific on them, as a matter of fact. You could serve them with fresh strawberries split in a second. So lots of wonderful things to do with them. Uh, your scones will freeze. Your tomato soup will freeze. Your risotto only if you have a microwave can you make it ahead of time and reheat. And your turkey loaf, it, be, it freezes like a charm. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next week, next time, I should say.
All the recipes in this program and in the entire series are available in Natalie Dupree Cook's Everyday Meals from a Well-Stocked Pantry, published by Clarkson Potter. This book contains a collection of over 150 recipes complete with do-ahead and storage tips. Order your copy by calling the number on your screen. The price is $20 plus shipping and handling. Please have your credit card ready when you call 1-800-235-3000 for Natalie Dupree Cook's Everyday Meals from a Well-Stocked Pantry. Natalie Dupree Cooks is made possible in part by Publix Supermarkets. Publix is pleased to support this and other quality public broadcasting programs.